what I'd like to do today is to talk about Poe Kim's um, work in general and also try to contextualize it uh, looking at artists who were working at the same time as he was in New York um, from various generations. Uh, let me also make sure I've got this working fine. Okay. So with any important artist, um, we enjoy the work, but we also want to understand it. We want to understand what are the motivations of the art. You know, what, what's, what lies behind this work that we're so engaged with and so impressed by. And there are various kinds of methods that have been evolved to try to explain to, and help us to understand. Some people turn to psychoanalysis, for instance. Or they look at history, or they look at art history in particular and look at the influences that an artist has assimilated and responded to and rejected. Um, and then there's formalist uh, approach to uh, looking at art. So it's just looking at how the work is constructed, how it communicates um, its content. Uh, you know, one of the questions you always have to deal with is like, how much of the, how do we look to the biography, the life of the artist to understand where their work comes from? And it's very tempting to want to understand, let's sort of say you can like trace the artist's life through their work. And I want to do some of that tonight, but I also want to, you know, suggest that there, we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that we can find the answers to all the questions we have in the biography of the artist. Uh, for me, with Poe Kim, there are two questions that, that really come to the fore. And, um, and you know, he's had a long career uh, from the late 30s when he was studying art in Japan to 2014 when he died. And throughout this, his career, he had, as you can see with these five images here, he went through various distinctly different um, styles and approaches to art, from uh, pure abstraction to uh, veristic, uh, realist um, representational art, to a kind of symbolist, fauvist painting, to abstraction again. So one of the questions that um, I ask myself is, um, is what does that mean? How do we, how do we understand this, that, that continual evolution, change, what does it mean? And how do we, can we relate this work, the different phases of his work? Uh, another, the other question, the other big question I have, I guess, is that um, uh, Young Cho alluded to the traumatic uh, experiences that Po Kim had in Japan during World War II and in Korea. Uh, during the Korean War, and can what is can we see evidence of that trauma in his art? And so that's like the other sort of tonight. Those are the two questions I want to focus on: is how do we think about how do we understand his um, periodic shifts in style, and also how do we relate the work to what we know of his life? Uh, so let's start with um, the question of uh, his stylistic shifts. And I'm trying to speak of shifts. So in some ways, he was very atypical of his generation in that you know, he didn't have like slight variations of the same style. He, would, he didn't start as an abstract painter and remain an abstract painter throughout his entire life, nor did he remain a figurative painter. So there are two great and stylistic heretics in 20th century art. Uh, there are more than two, but one of them I think of is Francis Picabia, who the, you know, some of you may have seen the Picabia uh, retrospective at MoMA a couple of years ago. So Picabia, who began painting Impressionist, post-Impressionist paintings, and then shifted to this Dadaist uh, uh, mechanical, not exactly abstraction, and then went into figur figurative work, and then at the end of his life became a purely abstract painter. And this made it very difficult in some ways. Picabia, you know, for a long time, uh, most art historians and museums and collectors 
didn't want to deal with the complications of the copyist's life. They just wanted to focus on one particular period and pretend that the rest of it was just some aberration. And now we're much more open to, we don't insist that artists be consistent we're, we're, and that you, we know like throughout your life you change and the world changes around you and your art sometimes has to change with it. So the copy is one of the, the other great example, I think. Um, let me just turn this off. Um, is Philip Guston. So Guston in the 1940s, this image on the left was painting um, figurative symbolist work. He then became an abstract painter in the 1950s and throughout the 60s. And then in the last decade of his life, famously in the 1970s, returned to figuration, but with a very different uh, attitude. So I think that when we approach Poe Kim, it's good to keep in mind these examples of artists who have been unafraid to change when they have this inner drive, inner necessity that tells them, I can't go on painting the way I'm painting. I have to, I have to reassess what I'm doing. Um, so uh, so why did, um, so Poe Kim comes to the United States in 1955 after, just to give you a, a sense of just how traumatic his experience was, he was in Japan during um, the, uh, throughout World War II and he uh, lived through the firebombing of Tokyo. And I'm going to just read a description, his own description of what that was like. Um, particularly the, there was a uh, firebombing of Tokyo in 1943 that killed over 100,000 people in a single night, which Poe Kim was there. And he said, the air raids back then were terrible. Every night, we couldn't sleep. The planes would come at around midnight. On March 10th day, the US Army Air Force completely firebombed fire Asakusa, an entertainment district in Tokyo. In the morning, I went out and saw dead, the dead bodies. Those who'd been hiding in dugouts had been roasted in the heat. A mother and child were fused together. They were trying to get them out, but the flesh was burnt. If you held the skin, it would fall off. After seeing that scorched woman, whenever I hear someone, some, whenever I see something burned, I mistake it for a burned human being. Clearly, like you know, he he wasn't just reading about war. He wasn't just experiencing at a distance. It was like something that was as a young man. He he really had. Um, you know, something that, that really was going to mark him for life. And as Young Cho said, in, after he returned to, after the war, he returned to Korea and um, had, was a, you know, falsely accused of subversion and, um, and ended up being uh, persecuted and in fact tortured by both sides throughout the early 50s. So he comes to, you know, naturally you can understand how he wants to get away. And, um, he comes to the United States, spends uh, two years in Champaign-Urbana, and then comes to New York City. Uh, and he talks about why, what he was trying to do in 1955 and why he immigrated. Um, and it was, it was something that was just so terrifying his experience there. So when he comes to New York, um, he uh, immerses himself in the world of the abstract expressionists um, in downtown New York. And this painting, which you, it's a little hard to see um, uh, on this image. You can see it, I think, better on the screen. So it's a, it's a painting that is like very dark in some ways, like, you know, do we want to see this as sort of the darkness? Is he like dealing with the darkness of his memories of, uh, of um, the war, of the wars, uh, which is certainly one possibility. And, or is this also um, uh, work that really speaks to and responds to and is in dialogue with the work of other artists working at the time? So I think that there's like a whole group of artists, Sam Francis being one of them, uh, Norman Bloom, Milton Resnick, um, who were also exploring similar uh, ways of putting together painting and influenced by artists like Monet. Uh, so 
while I guess it might be tempting to try to read into Poe Kim's work, you know, the sort of abstraction, his abstract paintings as somehow responding to his experience uh, in Japan and Korea, we can also look at it as a dialogue, as him uh, moving forward and trying to find ways to renew painting and to build on the uh, innovations of the first generation abstract expressions like Pollock and Rothko and de Kooning. Um, in one of the things he had to deal with coming to New York after his uh, first years in uh, Illinois was extreme poverty. He had no money. Um, and you can see that in the material uh, facts of his work. Instead of working on canvas, he began to work on oils on paper and generally of a small scale. Uh, One of the things that I think was, was particularly interesting, if you think about um, Po Kim coming into New York City in the late 50s and early 60s, where many artists in New York were very influenced by uh, Chinese, Japanese calligraphy. And Po Kim, who comes with the experience of the intimate experience of uh, Korean, uh, Korean art and um, Asian calligraphy, uh, thought a lot about his work in relationship to uh, an artist like um, Franz Klein. And um, in the beginning, uh, Po Kim was, and Klein, you know, the, the thing about the, what people said about Klein, oh, here's this painter who's extremely, you know, it's like taking ideas from uh, Japanese, Chinese calligraphy, and he's bringing them into um, abstract expressions painting. But for Po Kim, he found Klein's work extremely like a failure as calligraphy. He thought it had nothing to do with the kind of calligraphy that he was working uh, from. And he made the distinction between what he saw as the pictorial uh, approach of Klein, Franz Klein's work and his own calligraphic work. Uh, if you know something about Klein's work, that you know it, it might seem at first glance that it's the result of one gesture, but Eat all the black forms in Klein's work are gradually built up over, with many, many brush strokes. And you know, unlike Po Kim's work, which is in, in a much more traditional uh, approach to calligraphy, where it's just that single stroke, Klein is, um, is, is taking it in a very different direction. I guess over time, Po Kim, at, after first having great difficulty accepting and looking at and appreciating Klein's work came to, um, came to see, came to discover it as something valuable to him. So that calligraphy was incredibly important to a lot of artists at the time. Uh, one of the, one of Pokem's first shows in New York was at Cornbley Gallery in 1962, which is a very important gallery. And that same year, the very first show at Cornbley in 1962 was a show called Poem Painting, which brought together uh, the work of um, artists and poets who were collaborating. And uh, as an example of these, um, that close collaboration through the medium of calligraphy or calligraphic inspired painting, these are some examples of works by uh, Norman Bloom and um, Frank O'Hara, uh, and so I, what I'm trying to do here is to just to suggest how I think in an interesting way that Po Kim, his place and his understanding and relationship to, uh, to that gestural abstraction was informed both by his knowledge of Korean traditional painting and his engagement with what New York painters and poets were doing at the time. Uh, one of the consistently impressive and great things about Po Kim's work is that even within one particular period, he's always trying, he's like always pushing and 
surprising you. So, uh, for instance, this is again like 1961-62, a work which is uh, the same period of the the those small um, oils on paper I was just showing, but it's a very different like his composition here is very different, and maybe he's beginning to think about something that's not so calligraphic, that's more somehow connected to minimalism. Um, and it's also work, if you think about his relationship to Philip Guston, and this is um, one of Guston's paintings from uh, the same period. And you can see in, in this work of Guston's, there's the beginning of a hint of some sort of form that eventually turns into a uh, figuration. And I think that uh, as we can look now at Poe Kim's entire oeuvre and see how there are like, sometimes it takes years and years before something will emerge, but maybe there's like a little hint of it, let's say in 1962, that comes out 10 years or 20 years later. Uh, and again, just to another example of like, so it's still the same period and he is, he gives himself such freedom and he's also an artist, I think, who had seemingly an inexhaustible store of visual ideas of compositional. He was like willing to try anything. And I think also listening to the materials and like letting the materials lead him. So this again, is like completely different compositional strategy from the work I just showed you. Uh, but again, from the same period, uh, slightly larger. So there are, so the, 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 I guess for much of the 1960s, he was painting more or less gestural work. Um, I don't know, apparently Po Kim spent a short time in Paris in the mid like 66, 67. I don't know too much about what took him there and what he was doing. Um, however, you can see that there's something changing in his work in the mid 1960s. And I think that if you look at uh, an artist like Kenneth Noland, a color field painter, you can see again how the, there's this like dialogue. And, and I think that Po Kim is someone who was clearly extremely sensitive to and uh, connected to what artists were doing around him and being part of the community of artists in New York. Um, but then there's this dramatic, so in, 19, in 1971, suddenly, he, like he's been making abstract gestural painting from 1955 until 1971, and suddenly there's this absolutely dramatic shift. He stops making paintings and begins to work with colored pencil, and he starts painting artichokes and peaches. And paint, I love this one because it's sort of a self-referential um, work. Mongos, strawberries, and So there are different ways to approach, like, so this is one of the questions. So why does he change? Like, how do we, you know, one could maybe try to find the answer to his change in his biography. I know that he uh, met Sylvia Wald in 19, like, I believe they were married in 1968. Certainly one's partner in life can totally change how you see the world. And I think that like that could be part of the explanation. Like he's, his life changes, his personal life changes, and he wants his art to reflect that new life. Um, it's also true, however, that uh, the art world around him was changing. Uh, artists, you know, there was a lot of photorealism. He was not a photorealist. This is much more kind of veristic. Uh, it, it doesn't, it's not relying on the camera. It doesn't really allude to the camera. It's clearly, he's like looking at this with his own eyes. Uh, so maybe he's also you know, picking up on the sense that abstraction has come to an end. In fact, he says something like that, at least for him, abstract, the kind of the adventure of abstraction, at least up until this point, no longer gave him what he needed. It was no longer feeding him as an artist. Uh, what I like about these is they're, I mean, apart from his incredible skill and his great attention to the way things look, it's 
the kind of casualness of these compositions as if he's just, you know, when you come home from the supermarket and you're like putting things out on the counter and they just sort of fall as they, as they may. And I think that that's the sort of composition, anti-composition of this. And also just how he pays great attention to, you know, the freshness, the crispness, the ripeness or non-ripeness of these materials. Uh, I guess people say that he used to go and uh, go into Dean and DeLuca, which at that time was one of the few places in downtown Manhattan where you could find an endless store of great fresh fruit and vegetables. And he would just stand there looking at the fruits and vegetables in the produce department until the people came, the, the people working there came and said, are you going to buy something? Like they sort of trying to push him out because they just, he was just there uh, fascinated with uh, what was in front of him. Uh, I mean, you could, you know, we could read as often with still life, so you can try to read some sort of allegorical, symbolic meaning into them. Uh, but I, th I see this as much more, um, it's much more about, uh, about incredible attention to detail and it's about the time that's sort of the change that, you know, the, the calligraphic mark, which is created in an instant. And this seems to be just the opposite. It's the result of a very different kind of uh, sense of time. But one thing that I think that this work has that relates to the earlier calligraphic work is the sense of something in this more or less empty space, which of course is not empty. But instead of a, instead of a gesture in that void of the white ground, here you have an asparagus. So in some ways, even though they're created in a very different way, the relationship of image to ground, to figure to ground, is, is perhaps informed by uh, informed by his experience as, a, as an abstract gestural painter. And he gives just the merest hint of, this, of these things being located in space with just a little bit of uh, shadow. But you know, he's avoiding, you know, these are not clearly, they're not on a table, they're not, they're like, they're, they're sort of floating in, an, in a kind of non-space. Um, towards the end of the 70s, he began to experiment more and brought collage into his work and uh, maybe a, some, something of a more conceptual approach. So having worked for 10 years from 1971 till 1981 uh, as this working in this veristic, uh, highly representational uh, realist mode, he get, again completely changes um, and I guess the beginning of the change you can see in some paintings he was making from the roof of uh, the building where he and his wife lived, which is still the home of the uh, Po Kim Sylvia Wald Foundation uh, on Lafayette Street. And uh, here this looks like it's he's looking uh, east or southeast across the East River. Um, and here I think he begins to position himself as a painter of New York City. And I think there's a great tradition of painters of New York City. And uh, one of the artists who was working at the same time as he was um, making paintings like this. Uh, here's another one. Again, you can, you can see that. You can see that, I guess that's the power station that's just across the East River from 14th Street, I think. Um, but an, Another painter who I think uh, has a lot of affinities with Poe Kim, and they actually showed at some of the same galleries. Um, come back to that one in a second. Actually, I guess I'm going to have to go here. Another, I'll come back to those in a moment. Another Poe Kim is um, this painter, Paul Georges, who would go up to his uh, roof, which was on Walker Street, uh, just near off Broadway. Um, and he painted a lot of the same scenes, but with a much more kind of politicized allegorical uh, language as Poe came. And I, I mean, I find that 
it's, you know, to think about these artists in relationship to each other is very illuminating. So in the, let's go back here. So in the early, in the late 70s, early 1980s, there was really this dramatic radical change in contemporary art and um, with uh, the expression, neo-expressionist movement and transavanguardia in Italy. And for a long time throughout the 70s, the idea, there was the idea that painting was dead. And a lot of work was very reductive and eliminating sort of, you know, it was a lot of monochrome work. Artists were in, interested in uh, video and performance art and pretty much anything except painting and certainly not figurative painting. And more or less simultaneously in many parts of the world, artists began to, uh, to rediscover painting and particularly figurative painting and also to like reconnect with art history. And to look, and I think Po Kim was part of this, clearly part of this movement and he um, begins to look back to Matisse and, at, and to Fauvism and also to bring into art all these things that had been excluded for many decades um, and to like look again at like psychology and symbolism and sexuality and, uh, and also just the joy of painting, the joy of painting figures. So um, so I, let's see. Uh, so his work, and you can see, and I hope you'll have time uh, after my talk to see um, this actually, this painting is around the corner here in this exhibition. Uh, so I think Po Kim, one of the really admirable things of the many admirable things about him is that he never rejected anything of his past. Even though he would change and go from figuration, to, from, from uh, gestural abstraction to realist uh, still lifes to um, symbolist figuration, somehow he's carrying everything with him. It's, he's never sort of, never saying, I'm never going, I'm going to like, reject that part of myself. So I think you can see, particularly in his later work of the eight and of the 90s, and I'm not sure about the dating on this. I think it's, may, he may have started this or had the idea to start it in the early 80s, but it, it seems to really belong in his work of the 90s. Um, but he allows himself more and more liberty uh, as he goes on, and he's able to go back and pick up motifs and, idea, and, and the way he was painting in the early 60s or late 50s and incorporate it into this symbolism, this figurative symbolism uh, of his 90s work. And to also start to work with you know, very traditional genres like still life in a way that was not true of his 70s um, realist paintings. Uh, apparently, the way he approached these paintings uh, is that he didn't really have a plan, so he improvised them. And he, also, one of the things that happens in the 90s is his scale. He starts to paint larger and larger and larger paintings. And you would think if you're going to try to make a large painting with you know, dozens of figures and these very complex symbolist compositions, you would have some plan beforehand. And apparently, Po Kim did not. He like, I think, so that's in a way in which he's incorporating the spontaneity and the improvisation of gestural abstraction into work, which is also figurative. So he has this, he's like, as far as I know, he really never had a plan when he started these large paintings. They were, he, he kind of felt them out as he went along. Um, and, you know, clearly one of the uh, artists that was a huge influence uh, on him is Matisse in many different ways. And uh, I think in this painting, you know, it looks to me like it's a painting of his studio. And I think about all the great Matisse paintings of his own studio, 
where you see a painting of one of his paintings, and I think that's what's happening here in this um, Ho Kim work. So one of the uh, shifts that happens in also when he returns to painting in the uh, 80s and 90s is he begins to use acrylic instead of oils. Um, again, this is a, obviously a very Matissean uh, painting, but I think that it's as interesting and as important to, to relate Po Kim's work of this period to the work of his contemporaries. And I have some images here, I think. So um, one of the, uh, some of the artists who I think uh, are interesting to think of in relationship to Po Kim are the uh, Italian artists like Enzo Cucchi on the upper left, Mimo Palladino, lower left, and uh, Francesco Clemente. Um, and Clemente actually, like Poe Kim, came to New York and uh, was an immigrant uh, artist who explored um, a lot of the same kinds of deep psychologically uh, difficult and um, highly sensual uh, kind of content that you see in Poe Kim's work. Another artist that I find uh, interesting in relationship to Po Kim is the German painter A.R. Penck, um, who, uh, unlike Clemente, he didn't come to New York, but his work is like using this um, pictographic language, which is something that you see in Po Kim, but also the, uh, the like filling a canvas, like overfilling a canvas, like using every last inch. Uh, and, uh, and I think also the sense of improvisation. So I think he was like, you really, it's good, like good to see Po Kim's work as part of this, in the 80s and 90s, as part of this movement that expands around the world, particularly in um, Western Europe and in uh, North America. So a lot of these paintings to me seem like they're, they're they kind of are a Arcadian perfect world. I think about you know I think about Matisse's uh, the dance and music those great Matisse's of their early twentieth century and looking at a painting like this of uh, Po Kim it seems to be worlds away from that experience he had. Uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, like where, like so, is this is his work uh, kind of trying to escape and forget all the traumas and all the pain and all the terror that he experienced as a young man? Um, and you know, in fact, he talks about that. He says about um, his work. He says, uh, "Long ago, my life was not very peaceful, so I wanted to forget the pain." and only paint fantasies, things of beauty, things that were devoid of suffering. Uh, just as Matisse would have said, lux calme volupte. And, uh, and I think that that certainly is one of the things that art can offer us, is that you know, uh, consolation, solace, comfort, um, and healing, I suppose, might be the best term to think about this. And like you can think about all of Po Kim's work from the time he arrived in the United States in 1955 uh, to the end of his life as trying to heal and overcome and uh, transcend the terrible things that um, he uh, went through as a young man. And he was an artist who believed, it seems to me, that art has the power to, to, to contribute to this healing, that it has this, and it also is trying to communicate. Like, I think there's a sort of idealist, um, hopeful sense of, uh, kind of a sense of universality and um, 
uh, and a, a sense of kind of common uh, hope. And you know, the, his these paintings are filled with images that like you know, doves and people dancing and uh, flowers and animals and. Uh, so this is this Arcadia, but there are also paintings of his that um, periodically, uh, so you, know, I mean, you can certainly see this connection to Matisse, but periodically, at the same time, he makes a painting like Naked Men, and this is like, now we're not in Arcadia anymore. This is, you know, and I, so I don't think he ever, uh, no one ever completely can overcome the, the experience of early trauma, and I think that uh, what's so impressive about Po Kim is that uh, is that he has this sense that of, uh, I guess a belief in the power of art, and uh, both as a way of celebrating what's beautiful and and um, hopeful, and the sensuality and the experience and, and the pleasure of being alive, and having survived. But he also is cognizant of the fact that um, around every corner and in uh, constantly throughout our world, people are being brutalized and dehumanized and suffering the kinds of things he suffered and witnessed as a young man. Um, so I think that uh, artists that I find his work relating to in this period uh, Again, this is another really powerful painting. Um, and uh, our uh, artists I find interesting to think about in relationship is Nancy Sparrow and Leon Golub. Uh, interestingly, another couple, um, husband and wife, two artists whose work had a great deal of um, uh, continuity and dialogue, just as Poe Kim and Sylvia Wald had. And they actually, uh, Sparrow and Golub and uh, Wald and Kim were living not that far from each other. It suddenly occurs to me. I don't know whether they knew each other, but I kind of suspect that in the relatively in those world in those times, the art world in New York City was pretty small, and they probably did know each other. So it'd be interesting to think about what that relationship might have been, what that dialogue or influence might have been, even if they didn't know each other. They were perhaps looking at each other's work. Um, so then there's another, yet another, I guess we call a final shift uh, in Po Kim's work starting around 2007 and continuing for the last five or six years of his life where he discovers this new medium of colored tape. And you can see in this painting here on the left, the uh, closer to the stage where he begins to use um, color tape. And again, we can see, think about this in relationship to Matisse, particularly um, Matisse's uh, cutouts to try to find, uh, sort of pursue painting by other means. And, um, but unlike Matisse, what Po Kim is doing here is he's not only using color tape, it just becomes another, uh, another part of his uh, artistic language. And And I think also, in some ways, going back to the gestural painting that he was doing in the 1960s, these are actually, you know, rather than using a brush, he's making a calligraphic line with, um, with tape. And I think these are, I mean, for me, these are some of my, uh, some of the works I, I really am most impressed with um, in, uh, in all of his really impressive career. Uh, you can also connect the work to the early gestural abstraction in the use of the white ground. So it's like this very stark relationship between figure and ground. Um, so he's, a, a, again, I think one of the really impressive things about Po Kim is that he is always pushing himself and he's never complacent. He's like, he's never satisfied. So 
he'll work for a few years in a certain mode, but like he's clearly asking himself, so now what can I do? What, can, you know, what more can I get from painting? What more can I say? What more can I find? Like new materials, new experiments. Um, here's a great Matisse uh, cutout. So you can see that, you know, that relationship of uh, cutout shapes to the white ground. Um, but it's not, you know, I think there's a relationship to Matisse and influence, but I think that um, the work is also quite distinctive in itself. And so, but there's always, with Poe Kim, there's always more surprises in store. So towards the, uh, again, while he's working, uh, making these, um, uh, color tape on white ground paintings, he also begins to uh, work to return, to rediscover that gestural, like sort of loaded brush gestural abstraction, and I think produces some incredibly powerful and often very large scale paintings, um, like this one, Black Abstract, and this one too, which again you see um, that sense of uh, absolute fearlessness. Um, and uh, and also he's he's not you know there's no sense of him being kind of doctrinaire about a certain style or even about his own style like he he doesn't I mean I think that he was interested in trying to discover what art, the art was going to tell him rather than knowing beforehand what was going to happen. Um, this is. Uh, a painting of his, which I think is really quite powerful. And I, but I think about, uh, again, another relationship, which I think is interesting to think about is um, to Cy Twombly, which was a, this was a very large scale Cy Twombly painting from the mid nineties. But I think that, um, uh, again, very different artists, but I find that uh, since I, I, my feeling is, even though I've never met uh, poke him and wasn't able to talk with him. And my sense is that he was extremely um, attentive and open and uh, to uh, what was happening in the world around him, uh, in the art world around him, and constantly uh, willing to try new ideas. Um, let me just go back to this. Uh, what I'd like to do is just to come back to that the first question that I began with is um, so what really motivated um, his work and, uh, and how should we understand his constant shifting of style? Uh, and I'd like to just read uh, the last sentences of the essay, which I contributed to the, um, this uh, recent catalog of a show of Poe Kim's work. And I say that, um, There's a restlessness to Kim's entire career that suggests he may not have completely forgotten the pain of his youth, nor the unsettling effects of exile. Could it be that Kim's dramatic shifts in style and subject matter were not only a matter of his desire for artistic challenges or his response to the evolution of contemporary art? Could it be that his self-transformation from gestural abstractionist to still life realist, to figurative symbolist, and back to abstractionist, was motivated by his knowledge that as powerful as art might be, as much as he loved it, as much solace as it gave him, he knew that the forces of fear and violence and terror remained as prevalent as ever. Kim was, it seems to me, one of those artists who make the greatest demands of art, who wanted to be able to save not only the artist, but the entire world. Impossible demands, but ones that Kim could never cease making until the end of his life. And I think that's really one of the lessons or one of the things that we can take away from, uh, from like looking at his whole career is that rather than understanding his changes in response to the changing fashions of art, I would rather think about that, think about them as he had he was asking so much from art and that he was willing to pursue whatever path uh, it led him in and never give up to the sense that, that, you know, 
clearly art does not have the power to vanquish evil. Um, does it have any power at all? That's a question that's sort of, we maybe an impossible question to answer, but one we have to keep asking. But it's that Poe Kim's relentless questioning of himself and his willingness to um, open his art, to me, is a sign of his great faith in art. And um, as an art critic and as an art viewer, it's really inspiring, and particularly in times where sometimes it seems that art seems to be more uh, determined by or subsumed by uh, economic forces and um, institutional uh, influence to see someone who throughout a long 50, 60, 70 year career uh, never gave up on um, a faith of art as some kind of transcendent uh, experience. I think that's one of the things that one can take away from Pokim's work. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you. And um,